it's so horrible. I'm Professor McTaggart, and this is my brain dump on how food becomes energy. Once food's been chewed by your teeth, it's propelled down your throat and into your stomach, where it's held in place by two circular muscles known as sphincters. Your stomach's a sort of tank, where food is mixed up and made easier to digest. Here, the food's dissolved, squashed, and turned into a creamy liquid before dripping out of your stomach and into your intestines. These are tightly coiled tubes that can be as long as seven meters. It's while traveling through these tubes that the creamy mess that was your dinner has all the nutrients and other things your body needs sucked out. This epic journey can take food as long as four hours, and yes, that does include hot dogs. <laughs> I'm here all week. Tell your friends. Hello! I'm the world-famous Professor McTaggart. Open your ears, open your mind, and maybe open a window, because I'm about to drop a brain dump in your thought pan. There are seven billion humans on this planet, all chomping through its resources like a class of children in a cake shop. Copper, for instance, used by plumbers to make pipes, could be all gone in just 60 years' time or the average time it takes to get a plumber out to your house. <laughs> and it's been estimated that all our known oil reserves, used to fuel cars, generate electricity, and make plastic, will only last another 40 years. Imagine life without plastic. It would be fantastic. I'm being sarcastic. It would be awful. This problem of stuff running out also includes things most people haven't heard of, but use every day all the same. Indium. For example, essential for making LCD screens, just like the ones some of you are watching right now, might be all gone in just 14 years. Which means you won't be able to watch me on TV, or as I call it, the doomsday scenario. But fear not, the stuff we throw away contains a lot of these useful things, and by recycling, we can slow down the speed at which they're all running out. So when people say, that's rubbish, the rubbish they're talking about might not be as rubbish as it sounds unless it's Bob's guitar solos, which are really rubbish. And that is my brain dump. Hello, ladies. I'm Professor McTaggart, and this is my brain dump on gravity. Everything in the universe pulls everything else towards it. We call this force gravity. The bigger a thing is, the stronger its gravity. The Earth, for example, is huge, and its gravity is very strong. That's why we all stick to the Earth. We're held in place by its gravity. Even small things have gravity, like you. But unlike the Earth, you aren't very big, so your gravity isn't very strong. The Moon is smaller than the Earth, so its gravity is weaker. Which is why, if you want to lose weight in a hurry, your best way is a quick trip to the Moon. Oh, oh, nearly lost my balance. <laughs> I'm extremely clever genius Professor McTaggart, and this is my brain dump on brains. Can't pants make you smarter? Bottom line, put in a way you poor, simple viewers will understand. No. And neither will other horrible methods like electric shocks or drinking disgusting tonics. All of which people have tried in the attempt to make their brains even a tenth as powerful as my own. But there are things you poor blockheads can do to improve brain performance. You can exercise. Regular exercise helps maintain the brain and keeps brain cells healthy. Which is why I like to start every day with a hundred press-ups. It's not a pretty sight. A good night's sleep is also great for the grey matter, helping to sharpen both memory and attention. And that's not the only way you can improve brain function. Greetings, lovers of science. Buff up your neurons, open your minds, and prepare to scoop up my hot, steaming brain dump on viruses. Small things may seem pathetic, but they can often cause huge problems, as anyone who's come into contact with Mark's brain can attest. But unbelievably, viruses are even smaller than Mark's brain. In fact, they're much smaller even than the cells of your body. And they need to be. A virus multiplies by attaching itself to a cell and fooling the cell into making loads of copies of the virus. Sometimes, the cell makes so many copies that it dies of exhaustion. There are many nasty diseases caused by viruses, ranging from the common cold to life-threatening nasties like yellow fever. And it's not just humans that are prone to viruses. Animals, plants, fungi, even bacteria can get them. 
makes me glad I'm a disembodied brain. And that's my brain dump on viruses. My name, as if you didn't know by now, is Professor Alasdair McTaggart. And this is my brain dump on elements. That's elements, not elephants. Just like a teacher in a classroom has a register to remind them who's in the class, scientists came up with their own register. It's called the periodic table, and it's a list of all the elements that have ever been discovered. A lot of the elements have long names, like Darmstadtium, Praseodymium, and Technetium. So scientists have given every element a nickname. My nickname at school was Old Fat Legs, which makes it seem like a very long time ago now. <laughs> Shortening the words means that scientists don't have to spell out the whole thing when writing out chemical equations. And to clearly show that scientists are an incredibly brainy lot, the initials often come from the elements' Latin names instead of their English ones. So gold, for instance, isn't just G for gold, it's AU, because the Latin for gold is aurum. Thus combining two things that everybody loves, dead languages and hard science. And that's my brain dump. Don't worry, Mark. Maybe the shrinking scientists can have a look for your brain while they're down there. <laughs> I'm Professor McTaggart, and this is my brain dump about blood. Throughout your body, you've got a huge network of blood vessels, and these are all filled with, guess what? That's right, jam. No, oh, no, not jam. Sorry, I was looking at some jam. Blood. Lovely red blood. Delivering oxygen and nutrients all over the place and basically keeping you alive. Talking of which, you could lose about one third of your blood and survive, but if you lost half your blood or more, it would be fatal. So, best practice here is to try and keep as much blood inside your body as possible. Blood is driven around our bodies by our hearts. Well, I mean, your bodies. My blood's driven around by a small vacuum pump. During your lifetime, your heart will pump enough blood to fill 5,500 swimming pools. But it's probably best you don't try that. And don't forget, blood doesn't just deliver oxygen. It has many other jobs besides. Good afternoon, and yo to all you young people out there. As an international superstar scientist, I've been pretty much everywhere on Earth, and I know pretty much everything. See that huge smudge of green across the top half of the planet? Pine trees. And those green blobs across the south? Rainforests. Basically, like someone on a mad trolley dash, plants are all over the shop. And on top of all the plants on the land, there's the trillions and trillions of algae that live in the sea. Now, if you put every living thing on Earth together and weighed it, you'd find that over 90% of this massive weight is plants and fungi. Which means that animals account for just a measly 10% of living things. And that includes overweight whales, pregnant elephants, and people who eat chips for breakfast. Double E. And that was my brain dump. I'm Professor McTaggart, and this is my brain dump on sound waves. Sound waves are like the ripples that appear on a pond when you throw in a stone. They start at one point and travel outwards. But you can only hear them if there's something for them to travel through, like air or water. In space, where there's no air, you wouldn't hear anything, because there's nothing for the waves to travel through. So even a heavy metal concert in space would be as quiet as a public library on a Sunday. A sound wave looks like this. A curvy line represents the differences in pressure. Sound waves can be high in pitch, like a mouse squeaking. Or they can be low in pitch, like a bear growling. Or Mark's stomach. Sound waves travel through the air to our eardrums, where we're able to hear them which can prove very useful when there is a growling bear nearby. Always end with a joke. I'm Professor McTaggart, and this is my brain dump about the minuscule creatures that exist all around us, even though we can't always see them. In fact, they outnumber us massively. Take this little chap, the nematode roundworm. They're usually tiny, less than a millimeter long, but they're actually the most common type of animal on Earth. Unbelievably, four out of every five animals are nematodes, and they are everywhere. 
In fact, if you were to magically take away all the people, animals, trees, and plants, in short, every living thing on the planet, you would still be able to see their ghostly outlines, made up of nematode worms. That's because there are nematodes in all living things, even you. Not in disembodied brains, though. That would be disgusting. Prepare yourself for an insane look at what they don't tell you in the science books. From inner space to the universe, we're on a case to face the worst. It's icky and it's whiffy and it's yucky and it's squishy, but we love it.